Oh. Hello, my name is Mark Geyers. I'm an assistant psychologist working in the community pain service. Hi, my name is Mohammed. Uh, I'm one of the pharmacists that works in the community pain service. Fantastic, Mo. Thank you for um, having a chat with me today uh, about all things pharmacy. Um, just really wanted to start just by asking, you know, of course, pharmacy um, is something that's regularly mentioned um, in the NHS and hospitals and community care. Um, but for those who don't know, would you just give us a bit of an idea of what a pharmacist does, what their role is in the NHS and specifically what they do in pain medicine? Yeah, yeah so um as you as you probably know traditionally a, a role of a pharmacist was um you know working in a dispensary or in a chemist you know what we used to call a chemist and in a retail shop um, and where they would check uh, the prescriptions and the medications that, that were labeled before they went out to the patient um, but over the years uh, you know the role of a pharmacist has expanded as it has with other other professions as well and they've um you know the nhs has kind of realized that it's a very um sort of resourceful uh, profession that can do you know multiple things and do more things mm. and so the pharmacists have generally been upskilled and they've done more uh, and more different courses and things that are available uh, for pharmacists to do and so that gives them a, a it widens their scope of, of practice really um so nowadays you get pharmacists working in all different areas so you you still have your traditional retail pharmacists that work in you know your high street chemists and things like that but then you get your hospital based pharmacists who um who uh, sort of run a more clinical service so they go on the wards um and they go around to each patient's bedside and and review their prescription chart basically and um effectively the, the ultimate thing is that pharmacist is uh, considered as an expert in medicine and so they're often advising the doctors um you know uh, on what doses to use what medications to use interactions between medications um making sure things are being monitored appropriately and making sure things are safe from a medication perspective um and then uh, it, even within a, the hospital setting, you have so many different roles. So you have pharmacists that work in like a, a manufacturing unit. So they make chemotherapy and things like that. So in the production side of things, and then you have research pharmacists who work with like clinical trials and things like that. Um, and then you have other pharmacists who are, have done like advanced skills courses. And so they work in like A&E settings where they're actually assessing patients and things like that. Um, then you get your academic pharmacists who obviously are in, involved in teaching and, and education and things. Um, and then you have a lot of pharmacists who work in the industry and so working for pharmaceutical companies and things like that. Um, I think the key thing probably is that's made a big difference to the to the profession is the, um, the expanding the role for uh, as a of a pharmacist as an independent prescriber. So myself as well, having just recently you know completed that qualification. Um, it now allows me to be able to prescribe independently and so it gives the rest of the team uh, access to another prescriber basically and so uh, it also um, allows us to uh, provide prescriptions to patients where uh, we think that there's possible that there might be a delay if we wait for the GP to be involved and things like that. So it speeds up the journey for the patients uh, and the GP and things as well. And it, it, it just makes the whole process a lot a lot more safer. Now, so that's a, a role generally. And then moving on to sort of uh, in pain management, pharmacists in pain management is quite rare actually still. Um, there's not that many roles like, like this current role that I'm in up and down the country. There are some pharmacists that work in um hospital based acute pain services um as an extension of their role so they might work as like a surgical pharmacist or a palliative care pharmacist or a critical care pharmacist but they do a bit of pain management at this on the side kind of thing so because of their role they're seen as the go-to person but it's not a specific role in in that sense this role obviously is uh, embedded as a, ph a pharmacist is embedded you know into the actual community pain service so it's working day to day with with patients out in the community um so it's very different in that sense um and you you the pharmacist is, is with, as with the other the professions they're one cog in the in the wheel of, of of you know of the service that we provide so we obviously work as an mdt or you know as a multidisciplinary team and so we're made up of you know pharmacists um like people like yourselves as psychologists you know medics um and occupational therapists physiotherapists etc and so 
uh, we all kind of input our specialist and, and uh, clinical knowledge uh, and combine that with the um, knowledge and the experience of the patient and then uh, try and formulate a plan basically, um, you know, looking at all that. So it's, it's a kind of a new role and an expanding role, but apart from the face-to-face, -face, um, you know, clinics that we do, uh, we have a lot of um, other uh, roles as well, you know, non-clinic based roles. So things like developing policies and um, developing uh, medication safety, uh, looking at this medication safety issues, medic medicines management, what we would call, you know, audits and things like this, uh, and making sure that um, ultimately as a pharmacist in the team, you need to be confident that anything medicines related is being managed uh, appropriately in the team. Uh, I think um, one, of the, one of the things that I've heard there, Mo, is quite incredible. I, I wasn't aware of how far reaching pharmacy is in terms of all those different roles. And then in relation to your role as well, I've obviously with working with you, I've seen you wear a number of those different hats at, at different times. Um, and I think what would be really interesting um, would be here and what, what a sort of usual week looks like in the pain service uh, for you. What, what does your, I know you work in Preston, you also work in Ainsdale with ourselves. What does a, what does a normal week look like for a pharmacist in a community pain service? Yeah. It's a very busy week, yeah. Um, I think, uh, yeah, as you said, so obviously I work across two pain services um, and the, the setup is quite different, but the, the ethos is pretty much the same, if, if that makes sense. And so um, in, in the Southport service, obviously I work two days a week, um, on a Monday and a Wednesday. And so um, I run clinics on both days. Um, one is actually based in, in Ainsdale, but the one every other week I do a clinic based in Southport as well. So at the um, at the the, the health centre in the town in, in the town middle of the town. Um, so that just gives increases the accessibility because there's a lot of patients, especially with our cohort of patients, um, who find it difficult to access you know Ainsdale, and so we provide a service from there as well. Um, so I, I I go there normally as well. You know every other week. Um, so primarily yeah, it's clinic based, so we'll have one to one appointments with with patients um, that are sort of pre scheduled appointments. And that's either because they there is a specific medication issue that the patient's concerned about and has raised with somebody else or a clinician has seen them already and they're worried about something with regards to the medication and, and would like my input as well. Um, and um sometimes it's uh we're trying to work the patient up towards the pain management program so if we think that they're on a lot of medication that um, might be causing more harm than good and we think that they might benefit from the pain management program um, we sometimes have to um, try and reduce some of their medication so that they're able to engage better with the program and um, so sometimes it is for that and then we often you know discuss patients before with the clinicians or or after so if we if we hear or see something or discuss something with the patient and we're you know a little bit concerned or we think somebody else needs to be involved with this and you know big so we then take it forward from from that appointment and then discuss with other clinicians to try and as i said before make make the best plan for the patient um so we don't just see them like one person sees them and then another person will see them and everybody's doing their own thing we, we try and integrate everything together um the other time the non-clinic based time is obviously um goes around a lot of the admin stuff so writing and dictating the letters from the clinic you know looking at any any things that you've got following out from the clinic so um things like chasing up blood results scan results making sure that all that kind of side is uh, you're happy with uh, liaising with the gps obviously because medication and the nature of the the problems we often get um, ad hoc calls from patients and, and GPs and practice pharmacists and nurses and things um, asking for our advice um, or asking for clarifications around medication and stuff. So often, uh, even if you're just in the office doing admin work, you're often getting a lot of queries coming through even if you're not necessarily doing them, uh, you know, face to face clinics. We oft we also offer like telephone appointments as well. So sometimes it's not necessary to see the patient, you know, face to face. Um, or if the patient can't make it, then sometimes we would defer to like a telephone call as well. Um, aside from that, we do a lot of the medication management stuff. So uh, we've recently developed some you know, what we call PGDs, so patient um, group directions, where they um, it allows the physiotherapist to be able to inject um, medication uh, safely, you know, for the patients in a, in a clinic-based setting. Um, and so how we manage all the uh, ordering of the medication, the storage of the medication, um, and making sure it's safe, um, doing the audits for the uh, fridge, 
and and the temperature monitoring and all these kinds of things so that's one of my weekly jobs is checking the thermometer in the medication cupboard and making sure that the temperatures are audited properly because um the last thing we want is for the temperature to have gone out of range because of the heat for example and the medication isn't then safe safe to use basically um also the um the management of the prescription so obviously the actual prescription pads and um, they need to be stored and managed safely and recorded and audited as well so any prescriptions that we use need to be um, thoroughly audited um so that's uh, tends to be the the bulk of it and then once a week as you as you're aware we have like an mdt as well um, so all the clinicians gather together on that day and if we have any um, specific concerns or if we have any um, specific patients to discuss, um, we would then bring them to the table out on that day and while everybody's there, get everybody's input and, and try and again make a formulate a plan basically on how we, we do that. Um, the other thing I think the key role is the with regards to the pain management programme. Um, so the pain management programme is obviously a uh, you know eight nine week course basically one of the sessions is uh, around medication and how um, we can get the most out of medication in managing cr uh, chronic mm -hmm. pain so um, I deliver a talk on that as well um, uh, from the medication side of, uh, of things um, so that's a key role because it helps the patients uh, understand where medication fits in in the management of chronic pain um, and it and it helps to dispel a lot of myths as well um, and so uh, that's a really useful uh, useful thing to um, get the patients really engaged with self-management and not relying just on medication. Absolutely and one of the things I've heard there uh, Mel is actually around everything that you do is about patient safety but also support the patient as well and there's loads of things that are seen but also tons of things that are unseen so sort of checking fridges and making sure that things are done safely um, I think one thing that you mentioned there as well, I thought was really interesting and really refreshing, which was around we aren't seen or hopefully not seeing the team as individual elements, but something that is a, is a collective. Um, so, you know, not going to see the pharmacist to go and see the doctor, but actually there's been a lot of crossover. Mm -hmm. What have been the challenges do you think of working in MDT and, and, overcome, and overcoming those challenges? You know, being able to keep um, being an advocate for patients their story and what they like how do you keep that consistent yeah yeah i think it's really an interesting question and i guess each day is a, a learning curve and i guess the more you embed and integrate with the team the better you're able to understand the perspectives of, of other clinicians so you know from a personal perspective um having worked with doctors and nurses before it was a bit easier to integrate with uh, them professions but having not worked that closely with psychologists before that for me personally you know having joined the team more recently that was a, a kind of a new experience and so um you you can i guess you could either go two ways about it where you know sometimes people might become a bit defensive and and um not really engage but then you can also use it as a a really you know good learning opportunity and think i've got a another profession here that i'm not normally used to working with and they've got a wealth of experience uh, you know in this area so um how you can learn from them basically but i guess the key thing is obviously listening to to other other clinicians and their perspective and and really trying to um be comfortable in your own knowledge and practice but also be willing to uh, be flexible and, and and learn as well so being able to challenge sometimes you have to challenge because traditionally as a pharmacist working in in a hospital where i've worked previously you know mainly it's very um it's a very medical model and you you know it's very directed by by physicians and things and so it's um the, the focus is very much on medication basically whereas in a community pain service but you know in a chronic pain conditions uh, um, service um the management is completely different and so we know that uh, often medication is not the the answer and sometimes it can actually make things worse and so how where then do you go with patients and so it's vital and it's really I, I don't see how a service could progress without these other professions basically and so you soon come to realize that actually perhaps my my role isn't um as integral alone on its own as as i thought it once would be you know or, or would be but as a sum of the total you know all the clinicians it's it then makes it really important basically so i think being able to to listen and learn from other clinicians and challenge your own behaviors and 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 prejudices i think that's really important because a lot of times i've had to think step back and think this 
this doesn't not sit well with me, but it doesn't agree with the way I've been trained and the way I've, I've learned things all the way. Um, and I'm having to work in a really different way, especially, for example, like the solution focused ways uh, for me was a completely new approach. And you can put barriers up and say, oh, this doesn't work. But if you really engage with it, learn about it, try and implement it, then you start really seeing the benefits of it. So um yeah obviously it can have its have its challenges but you soon come to realize that um you know the more you integrate with everyone the, the better outcomes for the patient ultimately um that's the most important thing absolutely i think that was a wonderful um you know point you made there which was i've had the challenge you know that i'm not the my trainer might have said that i was one of the most important people in the room i'm still important but i am important as everyone actually yeah. collectively Mm -hmm. um, and that was a really re sort of refreshing point actually you made them know which I'm sure people would be you know, really happy to hear that everyone has um, equal importance including the patient you've mentioned as well including the patient's expertise that they bring to any session as well um, and that's really refreshing actually mm -hmm. um, again one, one thing Mo, when you were talking I was thinking about as well which is you know you mentioned there about you know perhaps medication and persistent pain conditions um, again, on an individual basis, you know, can be very helpful, but can also be harmful as well. And I suppose if, if a medication, if we think about an example of a medication review as being mentioned, that's obviously and, and rightly so would cause um, a little bit of worry or anxiety in the, in the person that, um, you know, that session is being, um, you know, invited for someone to attend. Um, how do you how do you work with when people do meet you in a room and say no i'm really anxious that medication is going to be reduced or what is the plan how how do you manage that yeah it's a really interesting question and and in in all honesty is is probably you know the the most difficult part of the job is trying to um convey the your knowledge you know from a clinical perspective to the patient but in a non-judgmental way and not trying to impose your um, opinion, you know, or, or, albeit it might be scientific or, or evidence based, but you need to consider that in light of the patient's experience. Why? Why is the patient, um, uh, you know, um, reluctant to come off medication? You've got to understand that, you know, these patients are often. Um, you know, chronic pain condition, they, they've got a chronic pain condition and this is the only crutch or something that they've been relying on for many years, you know, sometimes 10, 15 years or even longer. And here you come now and, and tell them that, um, oh, this is not good for you for, for whatever reason. And so, um, although you might have a good reason for it, unless you can convey that to the patient accurately um, and, and clearly so that they're able to understand it, um, then you know you 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 play you you kind of on the back foot. So sometimes it's really difficult to explain um, tricky concepts from a medication perspective um, to patients in an easy to understand way, and that really brings out. Um, it really makes you think of how how can I explain this really difficult concept, which even clinicians might find hard to understand, but in a way that I can Absolutely. translate it to the patient to really absorb that information. And um, so, um, so that's yeah, a really difficult part of the job. But I guess the first key thing is, is is important is to listen to the patient. What are their fears? What are their concerns? Only then can you tailor your answer appropriately. If you go in with the um, sort of uh, approach where right, this is this is what the plan is and this is what we're going to do and not really consider what the patient's feeling, then obviously it's going to be difficult for you because the patient's going to, going to feel like they're, they're not being listened to. So firstly, I just let them speak and say, right, OK, what are your concerns? And and I, and I agree with them and I say that, look, I understand, totally understand that this is something that you've been relying on all this time. And now we're telling you to, you know, we need to reduce it. So mm. first I try to explain to them and give them the understanding of why we're asking that. We're not asking them because, um, you know, we're trying to save save money or a lot of patients often say, oh, this is like a, you're doing this to save money or to say, you know, to save costs and things like that. So we often, you know, explain to them that it's not about that. It's all about patient centered sort of care. And they're at the heart of this. And if we weren't concerned about their safety, um, then you know we wouldn't be making these changes uh, and so often it's difficult to see because a lot of times the um, the patient might not be experiencing um, any problems per se 
they might not be experiencing any benefit from medication, but they won't be experiencing any problems per se. But we, we might be worried about the use of it in the long term. So, for example, opioids is, is obviously a big hot topic at the moment, you know, nas internationally, I guess. And often patients will say, well, OK, I'm still in pain. Um, OK, I, I agree with you that it might not be working as much, but it's not causing me any side effects or nothing that I'm noticing anyway. So how then do you explain to the patient, like, you know, um, what what are the long term harms of these kinds of medications? So you're, you're kind of trying to tell them what could happen in the future. And that's hard to engage with because it's not tangible. It's not in, in front of them. You know, if the patient says I'm experiencing drowsiness with this medication, you can relate to that because you could you could say, well, this medication can cause that. But if you're saying to a patient, you know, this medication can cause um, you know, problems with your um, immune system, for example, in the long term. Um, how do you um, get them to engage with that point? Because it's not happening right now, if that makes sense. So um, trying to make the, give them the understanding and and then ultimately having the approach again, this is something that I found quite difficult where um, you give them the information and then you give them time to absorb that. And so you say, look, you know, have a think about it. Um, we're not here to kind of impose this and say uh, there is the 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 whole thing doesn't work unless the patient is engaged. And so if they're not on board, they could agree with me in the in the in the clinic, but go home and not not follow the plan. So it is it's pointless basically if that makes sense. So we need their engagement. So if I think you know reducing X drug by you know 10 milligrams every two weeks or something is appropriate, but the patient feels that's too much then what what common ground can we come to basically and what uh, to come to an agreement where the patient feels comfortable because um it might take four weeks to come to the to the reduction but at least we've got to that point and it's better than so i always say to patients is there's no rush with these kinds of things you know this is a long-term condition and you've been on these drugs for, for many years so us trying to come in and rush within two weeks and say we have to get you off this is is a bit you know it, it, it can be quite difficult to understand from the patient's perspective so i always say look let's take it easy and we'd be guide i always say these words is we're guided by the patient basically so I, I i kind of empower the patient to feel they're in charge of this reduction so if at any point they feel this is too much i always you know encourage them to ring us up basically and say look i'm really struggling i think this is too fast uh, or actually, I think this is all right. Can I go even faster? Because I'd, ra I'd rather be off it sooner. So yeah. we let the patient guide us in that sense, and we just try to facilitate facilitate that. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so it can be difficult, but I think the, the key is the education. So as long as patients usually have the understanding of why we're trying to do it and the rationale behind it and what we're trying to prevent, they're usually on board with things. Fantastic. Sounds like you do a really good job in terms of listening, listening to their concerns and then being, you know, as collaborative as possible and also as well working within um, that MDT team as well. Um, fantastic. Well, we could talk for even longer, but uh, thank you very much for that. That was very informative. Thank you. Thank you.